Pino, Community of Practice Manager for Learning Technologies at ATD, moderator today. We will be doing some Q&A throughout today's event, so if you have questions for Alan, please enter them into the Q&A pod or into the chat module at any time, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Alan Partridge. Alan is a senior technology evangelist at Adobe Systems and has 20 years of experience in e-learning, education, games, and multimedia development. For the past decade, he has researched and reported on authentic educational solutions for audiences around the world. Alan is recognized for his many online video tutorials and e-seminars, which are a mainstay for e-learning developers and trainers learning to create effective online educational materials. Alan, I'm looking forward to today's webcast. You can take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Justin, and thanks to all of you. Uh, hello and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome one and all. Uh, folks gathering rapidly now from all around the planet. It's wonderful to see you all, uh, virtually anyway. Uh, today's session, of course, create mobile-ready e-learning in minutes with Adobe Captivate. I have a ton of information to go through, uh, so I'm going to go rather rapidly. We will leave the chat pod open today over on the left-hand side. I encourage you uh, to ask your questions on the left-hand side if you have questions about uh, the mobile content specifically. Uh, and uh, by all means, feel free to add your thoughts uh, as we go through today's session. I'll start with a kind of a, a quick foundational overview and then move right into more practical advice for creating your mobile content. We'll spend some time looking at Captivate today and actually getting some examples of how to create mobile e-learning content inside of Captivate. So our, our session today will kind of blend the historical, practical, and theoretical. I'll talk a little bit about uh, mobile learning and why it's significant and why you might want to be thinking about mobile learning for your e-learning courses. Uh, and uh, then we'll uh, take a look ahead uh, and get a better understanding of what kinds of things that, that will involve. Um, you know, one of the interesting things that we want to keep in mind always as we're thinking about mobile learning is that people naturally are inquisitive. They're naturally uh, uh, drawn toward information and education. And we see that every day in the way that people use their mobile devices. Uh, since the onset of mobile devices, you may have noticed that there's a sort of trend that has become almost obsessive. Uh, it's, it's become synonymous to expect that people, whenever they have a spare moment, are drilling through their mobile device, they're keeping their hand held in hand and working with it. A um, recent study found that 65% of workers declared their mobile devices to be their most critical work device, and that continues to rise. 75% of mobile learners praise the convenience and time management benefits of their mobile devices. They like that it makes them free to move uh, about and do their work as they need to. Mobile learners study uh, 40 minutes more each week uh, by studying everywhere they go. Uh, so it adds to their time, to their available time bandwidth, and it makes a big difference. Um, it has a really strong history of success, and as we look at it, it's just continuing. You know, I often say anecdotally that a few years back, we sort of thought that uh, e-learning would migrate itself eventually to tablets, but probably not ever migrate onto uh, mobile phones, mobile devices, maybe some performance support on mobile devices, but not really e-learning. And that really hasn't proven to be the case. In fact, tablets continue to decline in popularity. People still tend to sort of use them in the evening at home or uh, use them for specific functions or purposes. A lot of people take them when traveling and use them on devices when they know they're going to be away from uh, a network. Uh, but ultimately, um, they are uh, quickly being supplanted by uh, mobile phones. And so an understanding of uh, that trend is really important. And, and it probably has something to do with the fact that the mobile phone continues to grow larger and larger. Today, there's uh, seven and a half billion people in the world, and a, a half, less than half, are actually internet users. And I think it's important to kind of keep that in context because it goes to the question of whether there are two cultures. Um, that's about three Olympic-sized swimming pools full of M&Ms. So it, it just sort of imagine that and, and realize it's a huge, huge audience, but it's also only about half of the people. So um, I think that gives you a little context to understand. 
Uh, there are 3.69 billion unique mobile users and even more connected mobile devices. That's because most people in uh, first world nations tend to have multiple mobile devices that are connected to the internet. Um, most researchers agree that slightly more than half of all web traffic today uh, is coming from mobile devices. So no longer is it the case that most of the web traffic, internet traffic, is dedicated to desktop and laptop machines. Now more than half of it is actually being conducted on mobile devices. In a 2014 IDG survey, respondents reported using their tablets. 82% uh, of respondents reported using their tablets during the evening hours. Um, the, the pressure for getting mobile uh, devices and using those mobile devices at, uh, as tools for learning is coming from people. And I bet that it's coming from people just like you. I want you to stop and think for a second. When was the last time you did a search on your mobile device and you came up with a web page or a piece of content that just refused to fit on your mobile screen? How did you feel? Frustrated, aggravated, right. And I want you to think about that in context. You know, it's it's been, you know, essentially a decade that most of us have had mobile devices um, and, and really, I think less than that, that most of us have had mobile devices that had the kind of computing power that they have today. Um, the, the adoption of mobile devices and the sort of requirement and mandate that they keep ahead of the technology curve has been really substantial. And so, uh, that has led to this sort of presumption that I will be able to access my content on a mobile device. Now think of that in the context of your learners. How are they going to feel when they attempt to access their e-learning online and find that it doesn't work on their mobile phone? They're probably going to feel the same frustration. So there's this sort of presumption that it's all magically going to be done for them. And of course, if you've started to try to create mobile learning, you realize, hey, wait a minute, um, it might not necessarily be that simple. So I want to talk about just sort of hit five common mistakes that people make when they're trying to put their mobile learning content together. And I think that'll give you a good groundwork, a foundation to understand the actual practice of creating mobile content. Let's start with uh, the first. File size is way too big. So one of the problems that people often come across is they try to create mobile content, but when they do so, they're not conscious about file sizes. Now, way back in the dark ages, when old guys like me first started to create web content, we used to have all kinds of rules about how big images could be or how much video we could use or um, just anything that related to how much data we were sending over the web. And that's because the internet, believe it or not, especially for some of you younger folks, believe it or not, the early days of the internet were sending signals at somewhere around 28K per second. Uh, which, if you imagine today's internet, would just be unbelievably deathly slow. You would just throw your hands in the air and scream, no, 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 I cannot do this. Uh, and that was the fastest that it got at that point in the early days. So because of that, early web pages were extremely simple. They only had text, they had images, but the images had been highly optimized. And it was seldom that you would see something that was very graphically rich or certainly that had audio or video files along with it, because all of those things took so much bandwidth, and so very few people could see them. The similar situation exists today when it comes to mobile phones. It's not as drastic, obviously, but unless a person has a Wi-Fi connection and a pretty stout one, there's a limit to how much content they can view on that phone. In addition to that, the memory of their phone is also smaller than the memory of a typical computer. And so that memory limitation creates a situation where they have less space. So you want to be thinking about how big things are. Try avoiding uh, uh, having video or sound that is not optimized. Try to use video and sound that is reduced to the smallest possible sizes so that it can travel over those smaller bandwidths. Think about image sizes as you're working and try to make sure that images are optimized as you work so that you're not unnecessarily including super large graphics and images. Increase the leaning that you have for shapes. 
shapes use a thing called vector graphics. And vector graphics are a great way for you to be able to um, put together content that does not require as much bandwidth to draw. And so things like uh, create, just creating a simple background out of a shape, instead of turning to a photographic graphic image, will save you a ton of space when it comes to the mobile uh, device. And as we go into mobile, you'll find that shapes also stretch and alter their appearance in some cases, and that can be helpful as well. And then finally, think bite-sized content. Think smaller content. Think putting it in chunks. Think using the pages to their full advantage uh, to keep that information small. Another mistake that folks often make is that they don't realize that not all devices are exactly the same. So one thing to keep in mind, obviously, is the devices change orientation. So some are in portrait vertical format, some are in landscape horizontal format, some are traditional desktops, and some are much smaller. So that basic notion is what we call responsive. And if you haven't worked with that notion before, it's the notion that because looking at something on your desktop is different than looking at it on your vertical mobile phone, it's important to adjust the size and the shape for that purpose. Now, one of the ways that we can do that and the way we do it in Captivate today is with something called breakpoints. A breakpoint is a logical point where we can shift between a, one view and another view. And that's in order to respond to the different sizes of different screens and the different orientations of different screens. Um, a lot of people get confused at this step. So there's adapting, which is scaling the content down to fit different devices. And then there's also responsive, which is adjusting the layout of the whole screen based on the realization that you're on a different kind of device. So in some cases, you want to simply scale. Uh, let's say you've got a, a large iPhone and you've got a Samsung Galaxy, and you're trying to make sure you fit on both. Well, there's not a whole lot of difference between the screen size of those two phones. So adaptive scaling in that case is perfectly fine because it's basically going to fit nicely on both of those devices. But let's say you turn that phone from vertical to horizontal. Well, now suddenly your objects are going to either shrink way down if it were just to adapt to scale, or if you use breakpoints, you can actually make those objects realign into a new orientation horizontally so that they lay out and fit the screen better. So that understanding of the difference between scaling, adapting, and responsive changes is pretty important as you start to build for mobile devices. The other thing that folks often don't understand is that uh, the notion of inheritance and project design. So let's take a look at those. Um, how do we really change all of this content to make it fit for different devices. Um, think about it this way, right? We've got uh, tablets, we've got mobile phones, we've got desktops, we've got laptops, and then add to this that we also have horizontal orientation of tablets and horizontal orientation of mobile phones. So we have a bunch of different ways that we're gonna perceive the content. So to do that, Captivate introduces a concept called breakpoints. Breakpoints are represented by these large colored bars that you'll see in the top of the Captivate interface. The breakpoint is telling uh, the file that you're working on, hey, I'm on a different kind of device. And because I'm on a different kind of device, I want you to change the layout, the look and feel of this particular piece of content. Captivate allows for five breakpoints for different kinds of orientations. Think of them as Desktop laptop is one kind of orientation. A tablet horizontally is another. Tablet vertically is another. Mobile phone horizontally is another. And mobile phone vertically is another. So each of those represent different breakpoints. And in a breakpoint, you can completely alter the layout. You can alter what's on the screen. You can alter where the images are and all that sort of thing. But obviously, you want to save time when you're building that content. So Captivate is also going to automatically take your large view and propagate it down to the smaller views. And we'll look at that here in a second. 
Um, one thing that I think will be particularly helpful for you as you start to work on your projects is this. Um, this URL, um, and if you jump to it uh, right now, by the way, uh, keep in mind that your connect window will go away and that can lead to all kinds of uh, problems. But uh, maybe if you have your mobile phone, your mobile device, and you use this URL uh, to go to the, the, the URL on your mobile device, you'll see some pretty interesting stuff. You can even, for example, turn your phone uh, or turn your tablet from vertical to horizontal. And what you're going to see is that on your device, this website will give you the exact width and height in pixels of your screen. So this is a great tool for you to have as a developer because you can now check the size of the various devices that you're actually going to be developing for. You'll find that the Captivate team has actually put um, th those sizes into your copy of Captivate already but for the most common ones. But if you have specific devices that you're trying to design for, this can be a very powerful way to quickly and easily understand what those screens are for those devices. So Captivate uses a system of inheritance in order to pass information down. Um, and uh, that information can be passed down uh, through the, the breakpoints automatically. The way this works is that when you create your content on the top level, when you create your content using that desktop view, that information, sort of think of that as grandpa, right? So grandpa is going to pass down all of the information automatically to all of the other breakpoints in your project for you. That ob uh, information obviously is going to pass down to the sun, which you can think of as the tablet breakpoint, and then all the way down to the grandson, which you can think of as the mobile device breakpoint. So that information is going to be passed down automatically. Captivate will make some assumptions based on the theme that is assigned to that particular course. So if you have a mobile responsive theme in place, it will make some adjustments in terms of the size for you. But you have the power to make adjustments on any of those screens as well. So when we open up Captivate here in a minute, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but basically keep in mind that you're going to start with the big screen view and then Captivate is going to automatically duplicate and pass down all that information to the smaller and smaller views. You then can make adjustments on any view. The key to understanding inheritance of this, if you make an adjustment on a lower level screen, like down here at the mobile level, that information will not pass upward. But if you make a change on an upper level screen, that information will pass downward. So a change on the primary view will pass down to all the lower views. A change on the lower view will not go upward. It doesn't go upstream, it only goes down. Now, there is an exception there, which is if you've changed something on a lower view, then Captivate will honor that. So it creates a break and it says, no, you know, I, I know that the developer has said that I'm supposed to be this size, this shape, and this location. And it also uses a special communication uh, to communicate to you that that change is being controlled by this lower level view. And I'll show you what that looks like. But remember those colors that I showed you in the breakpoints? Those colors are going to come into play again because they'll help us understand which breakpoint is in control. Okay. The next common mistake that folks make uh, is that they, they don't realize that context is really important in terms of e-learning, right? So people want to have mobile learning support their work in the context that it's actually expected to occur. Think of it this way. Um, it, it's a good idea to develop learning, uh, mobile learning, if it's actively going to support the person's job or if it's actively going to support the training experience. If, however, it's just sort of a gimmick or if it's just sort of a um, uh, something that you're doing uh, because you feel like you need to, uh, that may not be the best one to do. So I know you have to make choices when you're developing your learning content anyway. You might want to think very seriously about, okay, which uh, program or courses are really going to benefit the most from having people have the ability to consume them on mobile devices. 
Uh, one thing that you can think about is that does it really let you leverage the environment? Can you walk around with it? Can you use the geo positioning? Um, another is can it facilitate performance support? One of the best ways to use the mobile app packager and actually uh, create things as apps and have people download the apps is in the world of performance support. So obviously for mobile devices, performance support, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, it's a great place to start thinking about whether you should have some kind of a mobile experience. Um, if the experience is personalized or informal, that's a good argument for making it something that happens on the mobile because it can be consumed in small chunks and it can be something that people really relate to. Um, and it also is a good place if it, it, it's somewhere where you want to facilitate search and repetition. Um, Location-aware learning is a good example of this, for example. Uh, I give the example of, you know, let's say you've got an insect, uh, uh, an insecticide group, uh, a group of uh, uh, people that go around and, and do bug spray and that sort of thing. Uh, so you've got the exterminator going out. Well, um, maybe you've got that exterminator going out to various locations. Uh, maybe you have a new program that allows you to upsell your extermination services uh, spe specifically for people who have waterborne insects, right? But you want your people, your reps going out in the field. You want them actively working. Obviously, they're going to customers' homes. There's no sense in them trying to pitch the new waterborne insect field guide information to customers who live in the middle of the desert, right? Um, what they really should do is if they approach an area that is near large bodies of water, then they should remember to consider pitching this new waterborne insects field guide. So if you use a solution like a mobile learning content and you use a solution like geo positioning, you can actually use the geo positioning to determine what regions you want to deploy that content. And then you can actively uh, have the content introduce that element when the, the uh, exterminator reaches a destination, a location for a sale, um, where there is active uh, uh, waterborne insects. So uh, lots of ways that you can use that kind of uh, solution. The next one is um, ignoring the usability differences. So one thing to keep in mind uh, here is that when you are actually uh, touching the device, there's an, a level of intimacy that develops, but also, more importantly, um, people have big fat fingers, right? Um, and <laughs> Those fingers are going to make a difference in the way they interact. So you want to be thinking about touch. You want to th be thinking about gestural navigation, rotation, location, communication. Captivate will do a lot of that stuff for you so that you don't have to overthink it. Um, in each of these cases, uh, keep in mind that the device has different powers. So because that mobile device has those powers, you can leverage those in the content that you create. Um, you know, you can think of the differentiators for mobile learning as that you can learn anywhere, you can learn anytime, you can move while you're learning. Location becomes a tool for the learning rather than just a coincidence. Touch is involved, gesture is involved. Those things are going to impact the way people use the content. Tilting or flipping may be a factor in your creation of content. Um, interacting with other people might be a factor. And of course, uh, the ability to create images and videos will no doubt play a role as we continue to work down this trail of mobile learning, the ability to you know, use the device as a camera or use the device as a video camera begins to play a potential role in the creation of content for mobile. Um, the last one uh, is that um, moving from e-learning directly to m-learning can create a sort of uh, disastrous outcome, right? Um, so you want to think about whether or not the course itself is something that's going to make more sense back at the desk. Uh, does it require that they use some documents that are available only in their office? Does it require that they be in a location or position where, in fact, it would be better for mobile? Um, is, is, is the uh, learning consumed uh, based at the moment of need? Are they in, standing in the factory floor in front of a machine where having training on how to use that machine would be most useful? on a mobile device. So all of these things really can make a big uh, difference. So think of it as learner-centered and context-aware. Think of it as enhanced in intimacy. Uh, and think of it as, as stuff that's on demand, uh, not necessarily on command. OK. Um, 
I'm going to jump to my sharing screen and I'll just pause for a second to see if we have questions. Check one, two. We're back. Holy cow. I changed. Sorry about that. I changed views and suddenly uh, suddenly my microphone went dark and I and I had to reboot my connect. So um, hello, everybody. And I'm back and we'll go ahead and share the screen. I see that there's a question there. Does Captivate Project have to be recreated for desktop users and mobile users or do they use the same file? It's all using the same file. Good question, Matt. Um, and uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. Uh, your questions will continue to come in this pod, uh, so by all means. And uh, by the way, uh, hello, uh, Lily Berry, Leva Vamus is in the in the chat pod, so I see she's answering some of those questions, uh, which is great. Thank you very much, Leva, for doing that. That's always awesome to have you uh, on the on the line, giving us a hand. Um, and I am, oh, see, I've been doing some videos, so I'm in my microscopic view of of Captivate. <laughs> Um, hopefully you guys can see this screen and I just want to do a quick reality check and make sure um, you can increase the size of the pod which is sharing content inside of connect so I'm going to jump back out to connect for just a second to show you how to do that at the top of the connect pod you're going to see a little kind of four arrow control that four arrow control will actually increase your main pod so that it's larger. I can, of course, force that out to all of you, but you may want to continue chatting in the chat pod. So just remember, if you do go full screen with the sharing area, you'll need to go back up to the top of your screen. A little window shade will come down and you'll see the control to go back down to the smaller view. Okay, so that is the end of your how to use Connect to get full screen uh, mini lesson and I will jump back uh, into Captivate. Let me um, see here. Oh, I, I always wonder exactly how is that I do that, but I think that's how I do it. Okay, so <laughs> um, you should now be seeing my Connect. Is everybody seeing my Connect now? Or sorry, seeing Captivate. Everybody seeing Captivate? Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. So um, we're inside of Captivate, and we're actually looking at Captivate and its main interface. And we've got a basic default project open, and that default project has a little piece of text that appears in it. For those of you who are new to Captivate, I want you to think of Captivate very much the same way of as you would think of PowerPoint. Right? You're going to have a series of slides, and you can insert those slides using these little drop down arrows on the left hand side. There are different types of slides like content slides or slides that refer to a theme uh, like a PowerPoint kind of theme. Uh, they use the same kind of language. They have a master slide and you can choose from a number of master slides that exist in that particular theme. And of course you can adjust the, the theme yourself and have it have whatever look and feel you want. Now you're going to notice one difference uh, between Captivate and PowerPoint right away, which is that when I select something, the properties of that something appear over here on the right hand side instead of appearing uh, at the top as they would in say PowerPoint. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, close that properties menu just so you can see the screen and point to this first piece at the top. Notice that the lavender color is on the piece that's called desktop. Now these can these breakpoints can represent whatever you want them to represent, and you can adjust them to whatever sizes that you want to adjust them to. But they are measuring the width of your particular project. By default, this is going to be set to 1024 wide. Um, this is a representation of the screen area that the content will actually go out to. 
this is a typical desktop screen size. Uh, in addition to that, you also have breakpoints for a tablet, which is predefined as a vertical tablet, and for a mobile phone, which is predefined as a mobile phone. Notice that that's the portrait view of the mobile phone and the portrait view of the tablet. Again, adjustments can be made. Just drag the elements on the side to make those the sizes that you need for your particular case. Now, you may also want a horizontal tablet. You can do that by clicking the plus sign here to add an additional breakpoint. So you can have that additional breakpoint for the custom tablet view there, and the same thing for the horizontal mobile phone view. And that's how you can actually get all five breakpoints. In many cases, you only want or need three. Keep in mind that as you add breakpoints, you're adding work for yourself. So you may not want necessarily to have all five breakpoints, or you may want to have uh, you know, uh, all five. Depends on the project that you're creating. So what's really happening here? When I add an object to the screen, I'm actually, whoop, sorry about that. When I add an object to the screen, I'm actually adding that object to all five views of my Captivate project, okay? Now remember that I mentioned before, the Ancestry works in such a way that it passes the content downward. That means that this particular piece Anything that I do to it is automatically going to pass that information down to the other views. But Captivate is also aware that the screens are getting smaller, so it's going to also adjust the size of those elements as they get down on smaller and smaller screens. The reality, however, of creating mobile content is that more often than not, you're going to want to eliminate certain pieces of content for certain screen sizes. You're going to want to move pieces of content for different screen sizes. And so in a situation like this, you may in fact want the content to be in a different location. Now keep in mind that I'm now looking at it in the low view. I'm looking at it in the mobile portrait view, which is the very bottom view, the, the ancestrally view that, that comes all the way at the end of the chain. So I've moved the star, right? But remember, things pass down but they do not pass up. So as I work my way back up, notice that the star goes right back to its original position. The star does not move on the screens going upward. It does, however, make that change downward. And now that I've changed the star, Captivate will honor that and it will say, okay, I understand that the developer wants this to stay that way. There's an indicator inside of Captivate on the position tab. So notice that I've got properties here and then I've got my position tab over on the right-hand side. Notice that this pink color matches the pink color for the position of the object. Now here's where it gets particularly cool. The way that Captivate knows how to put this star where it is as it's moving and sliding, because remember, we're gonna scale and adapt in our actual application for different size devices but we're also going to change at the breakpoints, just like that, just snap, change at the breakpoints. So the way that Captivate knows how to put those things in place is by using the position information, okay? And now this position information includes a reference to the top and the left. And the easiest way to see and understand how positions work is to click this little checkbox for smart positioning. Notice how when I click the smart position box, I can see visually where this item is. Now, right now, this item is set up to be 69% of the total height downward, and it's set up to be 68% of the total width to this direction. If you really had a star here, you would probably be more interested in saying, keep this star on the bottom of the screen and keep the star on the right hand side of the screen. So the way that you do that is to simply come over here and say, you know what, instead of anchoring to the top and left, I want to anchor to the bottom and right. I can say here that I want to anchor based on percentage, based on specific pixel count, or based on what we call percent relative, which is going to 
make an attempt to offset based on a calculation of both of those things. So I'm going to say percent here, and then I'm going to change this one to percent here. And notice how my smart position information has moved to the bottom and to the right hand side. That's now telling me that these objects are going to be glued. They're going to be anchored to the bottom and the right hand side for this particular case. Now, I want you to notice also that the positioning still hasn't changed for all my other objects because they're at a higher level. Notice that purple is still in command, not the hot pink, right? Purple, still in command. Purple will also be in command of all these other views unless I make a change. If I make a change to this view, anybody have guesses as to what's going to happen to my color here? If I make a change? Let's see if we've got thoughts. This is that's my Mr. Rogers moment. My my former students would all tell me. Oh, Leva wants me to turn on rulers. I'll do that too. Joy says it'll turn. See, it wasn't until I checked the screen to see if anybody had an answer that Joy got the courage and said it'll turn green. So Joy, I'm going to move this, and notice that it turns green, right? So uh, that's exactly right, Joy. What's going to happen is that this indicator is now going to show green. And notice also that the height and width of the object is still being controlled by the master. And you know that because the purple is around the box. And so if you think about it, these are very simple guiding principles. Um, and they're going to apply universally no matter which page you happen to be on. And so you're able to really quite quickly create your content and move your content out. Now I want to show you a couple of other things that, that will give you a sense of how powerful this is and how quick it is to actually be able to work with. So let's say, for example, that we had content here that was text-based content. Um, oh, and Leva asked me to turn on the ruler, so let me do that for a quick look. Um, it is under window and... Is it under window, Leva? It's in here somewhere. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Oh, she's telling me in the other window. She's like, Alan, why don't you have your rulers on? Turn on the rulers. View, show rulers, boom. She's probably saying there's a shortcut. There you go. So the rulers are up. Um, now, uh, the the other thing I want to show you is what happens with text. So again, I'm going to close my properties. And here, I'm going to uh, simply type some new text in here. And I'll say, this is the top. So this is the top level view. So I've typed into my text string, this is the top. Then I notice that the text is carrying down, 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 right? And that's because the text is passing that information from the top all the way down. Notice the purple box to indicate that. I can do the same concept even with text. So if I want to say this is the bottom, I can do that. And when I do that, I will actually see that I've got now the pink highlight around this box. I've got purple, highlight around this box, and as we go down, obviously the purple is going to control until I get to the level in which I made the change. So you can actually adjust dynamically the text, you can make those kinds of changes, and that actually comes in pretty handy because sometimes you have a quite long paragraph that you're using in a full screen view that's going to turn into a much smaller paragraph that you'll use when you're in the, the uh, smaller screen view. So you've got a, a way that you can control that and, and easily make sense of it. Now, I want to point out before I get too much further that in the pod, in the download pod um, that I shared with you on the first screen, which I'm also going to share with you here uh, on this other screen, files, um, downloads, and I'll let Avernil figure out how to Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try and do that myself. I, I want to make sure you have this downloads pods. Um, in this downloads pod is actually a, how to make your first responsive project with Captivate, a little PDF file that will walk you through each of the steps of how to create your first Captivate project in a responsive project with the breakpoints. So that's there. It's uh, called Responsive eLearning, uh, and that's there, and you can download that and take that home and and use it, download your free copy of Captivate if you haven't used Captivate before and uh, use that to develop your piece. Okay, 
Now, this concept works across all of the different kinds of content that you might bring into your project in Captivate. So if, for example, we said, okay, I want to take this star and I actually want to animate it. Um, I'm going to just uh, shrink down my screen a little bit so that you guys can see a little bit more of what's on my screen. And there you see I've got my little star. Um, and I'm going to change the fill on my star, make it a little bit different here. So I'm going to use a gradient fill, uh, and I'm going to change it to use a specific color. Um, and I think I'll make it have a little round puff. Uh, and there we go. So we've got our, our little star going on on the screen. Now, I want this star to animate across the screen. So to make this star animate across the screen, I'm going to click on the timing tab that's here, the second tab. Um, and if, by the way, your interface doesn't look like mine, don't panic. Just go to the window drop down and then choose the item that you want from the window drop down. All right, so I've got my little timing tab here. And it, using my timing tab, I'm going to make some animation. Now, there are several different ways that I can animate objects in Captivate. They're going to look, again, kind of reminiscent of the way that you might do this stuff in PowerPoint. Notice that I can roll over any one of these objects to see a preview of what that animation looks like. Notice this little drop-down menu here in my timing tab. That drop-down menu gives me a set of different kinds of animations. So I've got basic animations, emphasis, entrance, exit, and motion path, my favorite. So motion path animations will allow me to put a path on the stage, on the display space, and to adjust things according to that path. I'm most interested in this one, the custom curves animation. So I select that one. And then I'm going to click and just drag over and then click and then drag and click and so on. So I'm just clicking around the screen, making my little animation path. It's using Bezier Curves, and I'll click twice at the end to stop. Each place that I clicked creates a little control point. And if you've ever used Illustrator, you'll recognize these control points. They're what they're, are called Bezier Curves, but it basically gives you a little handle that you can use to get tighter control over the animation. So each of those gives you a way to control that more specifically. Well, that's cool, and my star is going to do really cool stuff now, right? It's going to, you can already probably see that my star, when I play it, is going to race around the screen from the beginning to the end. I'm not limited to just one animation. I can actually have multiple animations. So if I wanted to, I could add an additional animation and in my case, I'm going to say, you know what, I actually want an emphasis animation that rotates against the direction. So I'm going to put an anti-clockwise emphasis animation on. Now when I play that back, you'll see that it both rotates the star and moves the star around the project. So I get all of that going on at the same time. Now that's cool, but I want you to think about that in terms of the other devices. Notice that Captivate is automatically sort of shrinking the path, but once we get down to the mobile phone, the path doesn't really look much at all like the path that I had originally. And maybe if I had some text on one side or something like that going on, this path just wouldn't do on the mobile device. So I can actually make the adjustments just as I would for anything else. I can make those adjustments for my mobile device, and those adjustments will also be responsive. In other words, they will not go up to the top either. So things travel downward, they don't travel back upward. So your mobile device changes can be specific. And you can, in fact, make animation changes for your paths in whatever view you happen to be in. So it gives you a, a tremendous amount of power to quickly and easily be able to adjust. Now, there are also cases where you might want to have content on the screen, but you might want it to go away for certain views. Let's say, for example, I have a large image that I was using on my primary view. So I put my large image out there, um, and maybe I you know, want to use this shape in such a way that I say, you know, let's actually, let's just fill that um, with an actual image instead of filling it with a uh, gradient or something. I'll come over here to my images, click Browse, import an image file, 
uh, look around for something cool. This is pictures that a friend uh, sent me from my recent trip to Australia. So I'm going to take that one and pop it in there. And so now I've got that image inside of my little area. Okay, so I've got the image placed inside of my shape, and that's going to be a fairly large kind of piece. But what about when it gets over to the other pieces, it's going to get kind of small, and maybe eventually it gets so small that I don't think it's really valid. Well, I can actually say, you know, I don't have room on my mobile view for this image. I just want the messaging or the learning that I actually want to occur. And so I can take this and just drag it off into the scratch space, and that will eliminate it from the download. It will eliminate it from the view. It will eliminate it from your project. So dragging something off is sort of like deleting it from a single view. Now you don't want to do that. You don't want to just delete it, because if you simply delete it, it'll go away everywhere. But if you want to remove it from one single view, just drag it off the screen into the side space. So anywhere in the scratch space, and it'll automatically eliminate it from that view. So when people pull that content down for their mobile phone, they can see only that content uh, on the other views. They can't see it on the mobile phone view. Uh, let me pop back over and see how we're doing on questions. Uh, how are we doing on questions? Lots of good stuff going on in the uh, in the chat here. Uh, we had a question early on that a lot of people were interested in, and it's a question I've heard uh, in other mobile presentations. But it's essentially that how do you um, how do you deal with the issue that not all your of your staff are going to have a smartphone, or the issue of uh, can you require staff to to do training on their own personal phone? Uh, any insight on how to handle that? Excellent question. That is an excellent question, and I, I have heard this coming more and more. So um, it depends on the specific organization and the rules of the organization. This has been trending in the direction of bring your own device. Um, and it continues to trend in the direction of bring your own device. So I, I've worked with organizations where they provide the devices for the individual, and that's basically the compensation. I've worked with organizations where every, literally every moment of training has to be clocked, and they rely upon the back-end learning management system to provide the timing in order to understand how much time has spent uh, consuming the e-learning content. And then I've worked with other organizations, many more of them recently, where their learners are on the go. Um, this typically happens in knowledge worker kinds of environment, in salaried environments. The people consider their job their job, and so they're actually grateful for the opportunity to consume it on the go and are not too concerned about you know, whether or not they clocked in in an hour here or there. Um, so the situation is going to vary pretty broadly. It has definitely been trending more toward bring your own device. Um, the not everybody's going to have a device situation uh, is conceivable, but it's becoming less and less of a problem. The other thing to consider, I thought when we first started the question, one of the thoughts that you may have was um, video. I saw that there were some questions about how to handle video in mobile, and it, it's an excellent question because what actually happens on most mobile devices is that, it actually happens on your desktop and laptop too, but you don't realize it as much. But what tends to happen um, is that the video player takes over the device for the moment that they mm -hmm. start to consume the video. So even though you may design the content to have the video here or there, what's actually going to happen is that video is going to play full screen. So you have to start becoming aware of that and thinking about that even as part of the design of that video for the smaller profile device as well, that it's going to kind of launch full screen they're going to consume it from a full screen space, and then they're going to return back to your learning content at the conclusion of the video. Uh, and it kind of changes your perception. of What's this moment going to be like? Um, I always tell people, you know, the best way to do is kind of just really uh, execute one, put a slide together, put the video in, pull it up on uh, a couple of mobile devices that by far the most common two are the uh, Apple iPhone and the mm -hmm. Samsung Galaxy. Uh, so if you know, you have one of each of those for testing purposes. You've gone more than halfway to determining, in most use cases, whether or not it's going to work on the mobile phone. Uh, any other questions kind of pending for folks? 
Yeah, seen a couple uh, couple Captivate specific ones. One from Mike. Uh, are there settings within Captivate that allow you to emulate certain settings, like good ba bandwidth, bad bandwidth, different types of devices? Excellent question. There, there are. Let me actually show you, Mike, what you can do in Captivate that can kind of give you a good, quick sense of what's going on. So, uh, if you go over here and choose Preview, uh, and then preview the project. Um, in this mobile responsive view, previewing the project is actually going to show you the project um, in a responsive emulator. And that responsive emulator is going to show you what happens in different contexts. So obviously Captivate does not publish finished content with uh, little you know, buttons at the top and with the slider. These are added for your preview purposes so that you can see the breakpoints. And it's a good way to also just take a moment to see what happens when we do breakpoints. I'm actually going to jump back in and just put a pause on this second slide um, in Captivate for those of you who haven't used it. Uh, you actually want to um, deliberately pause items. So what I'm going to do to make that happen is choose my smart shape here, uh, which I can turn into a button. So I'm going to go to my smart shape and say, let's use it as a button. And then I'm going to check on the timeline and just make sure that on my timing that my button is actually going to uh, pause. So you can see there that I've added a pause into my button so that that's going to actually pause our project. And the reason I did that is so when I preview the content in the project, it'll pause for us so we can look real time at what's happening with the scaling over multiple devices. So we've got our little piece of content here and then that's running our animation. Um, at, as I jump breakpoints, you can see layout differences that we may have made in the different views from the, the breakpoint. But what happens between is one of the things that people often find confusing. So this slider actually lets you see what's going to happen at the moments when the scaling is occurring. So you can see that as I scale to different widths, I'm actually going to get different layouts, right? And as we get to a breakpoint, let's go all the way down to the 415, the 414, uh, you'll see that the, the layout will actually snap for the different breakpoints. You gotta go all the way down, 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 down. There we go. See how it snaps? So the breakpoint is gonna snap the layout. And if you have major design differences, you'll see those at the breakpoint. But it'll also scale across the distances between those breakpoints. So that you get different layout experiences and that's where a lot of the the kind of joy and and uh, sorrow comes in building mobile responsive projects is that you you kind of find yourself in the business of anticipating what's going to go right what's going to go wrong what's going to happen with the scale all of that kind of stuff there were a few other um, ones i know we're getting close questions. to uh to the top of the hour so i want to make sure that you're able to get through the rest of the stuff that uh that you have um but there was a, a good question on uh, 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 on accessibility in Captivate. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Excellent question. So accessibility in Captivate uh, is handled on the per object basis through the little chips down here um, on the right hand side. So you choose an object and then choose the little chip. You'll see the accessibility tab Captivate actually supports both the labeling of the content. By the way, don't auto-label if you're making accessible content. Actually put the name and the description in um, because the auto-labels have weird numbers and indices and things like that. It will not help someone who's you know needing that to be read for them. And then in addition to that, Captivate also supports the, um, the ability to, uh, to um, uh, control the tab order. So for those of you who do a lot of accessibility, choose the slide. I, you'll notice I went out to the scratch space so that I choose the whole slide, not one object. Then come over to the same panel, choose tab order, and there you can actually control the tab order for interactive objects. Okay, so let me do, I want to do just uh, one more quick uh, example of, of the kinds of things that you can do in the mobile response, just to kind of give you that one last parting thought. Um, and let's just do it with uh, question slides. So um, question slides feed in Captivate based on the theme or template that you're referring to. And so when you set up your content in, in Captivate for mobile responsive,
you want to make sure that you're using a theme which has the mobile responsive questions built in. But once you do, then Captivate will actually automatically handle that content for you. Other than that, all you have to do uh, is go in and obviously type your questions and your answers. So it's a great way to be able to very quickly develop your quiz content. Um, one of my favorite aspects, of, cor of course, with the whole uh, question slides and Captivate is that you can always go back in, create more, you can drop those in, you can move them around, uh, you don't have to leave them in the same order, you can change the graphical appearance, change the content, all of that kind of stuff. So um, certainly there's a lot to um, encounter, but there's also a lot of magic there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention while we were doing the animation is just uh, if you haven't used the new animation in Captivate before, you may not realize that we've changed it substantially. Um, you now, of course, can have the preview on the timing tab, but you also can see through this little drop down toggle on the timeline, you can actually see the timing of the animation and make adjustments to it there. So if you want to adjust when the, the uh, animation begins or how long it plays, uh, all of those kind of things can be done through this little drop down tab for the animation. Um, so those are the, the kind of big level uh, elements of mobile responsive. One other thing to be aware of uh, is that when you get ready to publish your content out, you can publish that content out for devices. That means that you're publishing it out as HTML5. That HTML5 is then loaded into any web present location and it will play the content back autom automatically. It will detect what device it's on. So you don't have to publish five different times for five different views. You just publish once and then when a person accesses it from a mobile phone, it delivers the mobile phone view. When a person accesses from a tablet, it delivers the tablet view and so on. Um, it also is possible to publish for an app using our published app solution. So of course Adobe has one of the preeminent solutions for publishing and packaging apps. This converts your HTML5 project into a mobile app for iPhone or for Android or for WebOS and so on. Uh, so you just use this option if you want to make it into a mobile app. Generally speaking, I recommend to people, if you want it to be a mobile app, it should probably be something like performance support. People get really irritated if they have to download individual courses onto their device and then it never goes away, right? They, they, they tend to not delete them. And so they feel like that's loading up their device. But if it's performance support, they're using that all the time. So performance support, apps made for each other, courses, apps, nah, not so much, right? Um, you can also obviously publish to Adobe Connect. And now you can publish directly to Adobe Captivate Prime. If you haven't checked out Adobe Captivate Prime, I encourage you to do so. An amazing full feature LMS from Adobe uh, and a great way to do it. While we're on the topic of LMS, just one last thought about LMSs. Many LMSs do not support responsive output. So I know I hear from people all the time, they finished their project, they got it all responsive, it was all awesome, it worked on their internal servers, it worked on their website, they put it in their LMS and pfft, it just disappeared. It's the LMS. So your LMS must support responsive content if you want it to continue to be responsive content when they actually consume it. So it's one, one more factor to be aware of when you're thinking about your learning management system. Um, if your learning management system is older, it may just pop a fixed window JavaScript and it will refuse to adjust the size. And of course that, that ruins all of your hard work on the, on the responsive. So uh, that one last feature to, to be aware of. Um, cool. Uh, any last questions? I yeah, there was a, a good question the and our, our that was already time. answered in the chat, but I think it's worth kind of uh, just mentioning here. Question about what's one of the advantages to publishing as an app, and it seems like when you publish as an app, you're actually downloading that to your phone. So if you're out in the field or don't have connection to Wi-Fi, then you're able to access that content. Exactly, Justin. That's totally the advantage. It can be offline. Uh, think of, you know, work checklists or um, things that you want people to have quick access to, videos or support documents that they might need when they're away from a network. All of those things can be packaged up in an HTML5 app. Uh, you, they don't mm -hmm. even need the, the web to be able to consume that content and view it. So 
Um, that's that's exactly what yeah. you want to well, do. Well, we are just about to the top of the hour. Can we uh, remind everyone um, where they can download the presentation? And this was recorded, so everyone will receive a link to this, right, Alan? Uh, absolutely, it was recorded, and you should get a link for the recording. Um, and Avranil can tell us how that happens. I'm go I'm back on the main page. Apologies for those of you who I jumped chat boxes. You can see uh, more information here. Before I let you all go, I want to remind you, elearning.adobe.com. So it's just like going to adobe.com, but instead of saying www, try what try saying elearning. Elearning.adobe.com. Now over 30,000 members with active blogs every single day. People are posting awesome articles. It is absolutely an amazing community, and I hope that you all will sign up, join, and join in the conversation. You, too, can contribute to the things that are happening on elearning.adobe.com. So it'd be great to have you all there. Uh, of course, down in the pod here, you see the download for the uh, presentation today, as well as the download for the responsive e-learning, uh, and uh, we'll get this uh, recording uh, posted for everybody uh, in uh, Lickety Split here. Uh, you'll notice also the recorded webinars and the upcoming webinars are linked in the link pod. Cool, at yeah. The bottom of the page. Thanks, and Alan, I just want to say I know Adobe is going to be at our international conference in exposition next month. Are you going to be there as well? Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> Is that, which one is that? Well, I think I'm not. I well, think if that, you that all do want to um, connect with Adobe, they are going to be at the International Conference. Uh, so check them out in the expo. They are booth 1310. You cannot miss them. So uh, thanks again, Alan. This was a lot of fun.